First of all, I should say I'm here with my new hat on as a hat I've held since July last year. It's the um, Perils of Not Archiving Old CVs. Um, so I'm currently the head of our macro group, which makes a bit more sense about what I'm going to talk about. There's a long and uh, uh, productive tradition of discussion between the Treasury and CEDA on the macroeconomic outlook and how this will affect Australian wellbeing. And right now that conversation is as important as ever. And so it's a pleasure to be here. And I might say, given it's uh, International Women's Day, it's a pleasure to be on a panel with a woman. Um, there should be more of it in our profession. Uh, my remarks this morning are going to focus on global developments and their implications for our macroeconomic outlook. As you'd expect, we're currently in the middle of a budget forecasting round, and I'm not going to, uh, sorry, I'm not going to give you a, any headlines on that. Um, I then want to uh, uh, finish with a few words on forecasting. But the broad context for my remarks is that the Australian, as I've said before, the Australian economy has performed remarkably well over the past couple of decades. And that's been in the face of some of the largest global supply and demand shocks in the best part of a century. And while we might always prefer somewhat better outcomes, particularly on unemployment, our current central case is for the economy to continue to perform well. As a small open economy, uh, foreign investment, trade and immigration are key to our economic outlook and global conditions matter to us. Over the past few decades, the global economy has been in a continual state of transformation, extraordinary technological advancement, a stunning increase in global connectivity, and tectonic shifts in the geographic balance of economic power. Partly through good fortune, and partly through the application of good economic policy, these changes have contributed to an enormous increase in Australian living standards. Decade after decade, let's see, this is gonna, I don't quite know where I point there, whoops. Let me get this right. Sorry, Ross, you're gonna to have to lean around. Um, <laughs> decade after decade, we have produced more goods and services and our national income, our national purchasing power has grown in line with these increases. So in this chart, which goes back to uh, December 1970, the blue line is uh, the growth in real gross domestic product and the red line is the growth in real uh, gross national income. And you can see that there's been, uh, through history, a strong relationship between the two. But uh, in the past little while, that relationship has shifted markedly. And this has been a striking feature of the past 15 years. Earlier this millennium, driven by strong global conditions, the price of our exports surged not only did this demand for, uh, global demand for commodities result in more real activity, a huge growth in mining investment and export volumes, it delivered Australia a striking and very large positive income shock. That income shock was positive for our commodity exporters, but more importantly, it was positive for Australian households. Their incomes were supported by real exchange rate appreciation during the commodity boom. The other thing it supported was government revenue. While the global financial crisis interrupted the terms of trade boom, and you can see that quite strikingly in the chart, uh, you can also, you can see though, how extraordinarily large was the divergence between the growth in output and the growth in income. Not seen elsewhere on the chart. Fast forward to 2016. Today, production and employment are expanding at a solid pace. But the downturn in our terms of trade since 2011-12 has seen growth in national income first drop below GDP growth and then stall. And it's been shrinking on a per capita basis. Since the terms of trade peak in 2011, we have had declining net national disposable income per capita, a measure that's regarded as a proxy for standards of living. Still, uh, this chart, which is in levels, uh, again, the blue line is uh, the level of real GDP and the red line is the level of real GNI, gross national income. What this chart shows is that Australia continues to enjoy much of the higher income that has been driven by the terms of trade boom. So what's next? For one thing, we cannot rely on a resurgence in the global economy to underwrite our national prosperity. Global growth has struggled to regain sustained momentum post the global financial crisis and global aggregate demand remains weak. This is despite monetary policy settings in nearly all of the major economies that remain extraordinarily accommodative. And global public debt increasing to, to uh, very high levels since the global financial crisis, that's on a global scale. 
Today, global risks are tilted to the downside and they've intensified in recent months. We've seen deterioration and heightened volatility on global equity and credit markets, and markets seem to be questioning whether global growth will be strong enough to drive corporate earnings and maintain low default rates in order to sustain current valuations. In a lower growth, lower inflation world, there may well be con continued heightened volatility on financial markets. The major official forecasters have continued to downgrade prospects for global growth. In January, the IMF downgraded its forecast uh, it was the 17th downgrade in five years. Who'd be a forecaster? Last month, the OECD also downgraded its outlook for world growth. Slower global growth has been accompanied by a number of trends that are observable across the global economy. Slower growth in trade, weak business investment, slower productivity growth, slower population growth in the advanced economies, low inflation, and importantly, lower inflation expectations. Even against the long anticipated backdrop of slower growth in the working age population in, in major advanced economies, official forecasters are also reconsidering their view of long run potential GDP growth. This partly reflects the ongoing legacy of the global financial crisis. Crises, fun, big deep financial crises have long lived effects on investment in productive capital and on labour markets. In the labour market, you can expect an increase in structural unemployment and lower labour force participation. In addition, recent estimates by the IMF suggest that productivity growth was slowing in advanced economies even before the global financial crisis. More recently, uh, in the globe, we have observed that the convergence between emerging and advanced economies that we'd seen since the turn of the century is showing some signs of stalling. So in this, this chart, which is the ratio of emerging market GDP to US GDP per capita, um, you can see that in the past three years the, the, there's been some slowing in this. And this is something that the IMF has picked, on and picked up on and, and, and expressed some concern about. If that stalling does occur, it's going to affect the outlook for future global economic activity because the big drivers of global growth in the recent times have been emerging markets, not advanced economies. It could also have broader consequences. So this view of the world, that view of the world, sounds a little grim. But not all global developments are so clearly challenging for Australia. As Michael has said, the Australian economy is today more than ever connected to China. And this uh, is a quite striking map. Uh, in short, the bluer, the darker the blue, the closer the trade connection between a country and China. You can see that Australia's got the highest proportion of its exports going to China of any advanced economy. China accounted for around a third of our total merchandise exports in 2014, up from 10% a decade earlier. 20 years ago, the Chinese economy was less than a third of the size of the US economy. Today, China is the largest economy in the world in purchasing power parity terms. Despite slowing growth, China remains one of the fastest growing economies in the world and its official growth target uh, has been set just over the weekend at between 65 and 7% for 2016. Within that overall growth outcome though, there is some significant restructuring occurring in China, with a major driver of growth shifting gradually from investment to consumption albeit somewhat reflecting government spending rather than a pronounced pickup in household consumption. At the sub-national level in China, growth is widely different between provinces. The old economy of provinces in the northeast that rely heavily on mining and heavy industry are experiencing low growth and at times sharp contractions that's being driven by a slowing industrial sector. Thus far, Australia's resources production has held up well. Reflecting our higher quality iron ore and lower costs, Australia has increased its share of China's total iron ore imports, even as the industrial sector has slowed, and our export volumes to China have continued to grow. The substantial increases in global supply, including from Australia, are the main driver of falling commodity prices. But the slowdown in China's industrial sectors is also causing some impact on world commodity prices, and it's been reducing Australia's terms of trade and our real incomes. 
The outlook for the northeast of China contrasts with provinces in the south and along the eastern seaboard in which rapid, rapid technological adoption and innovation is supporting robust income and consumption growth. And this is consistent with the Chinese authorities' objectives of transitioning the economy to one reliant on consumption and services as the drivers of growth. That transition is creating opportunities for Australia. In our business liaison program, we are seeing a strong interest from Australian businesses in taking advantage of this opportunity. China is already our largest destination for services exports, having increased from around 3% of our services exports in 2000-2001 to around 14% last financial year. China is now our large, second largest source of overseas visitors, and they spend far more than the average when they come here. There were over one million arrivals last year, and as impressive as that is, it's still only 1% of China's outbound tourism market. And I don't need to tell this audience that the Chinese middle class is a growing market. So we're part of China's transition, and China is helping, is part of our transition. A transition that is, in Australia, to broader-based drivers of growth, uh, which is underway as we leave behind the investment phase of the mining boom. And we can see evidence of this transition in the services sector, where employment is growing at its fastest pace in a decade, and services exports are growing strongly, partly in response to the depreciation of the Australian dollar. For example, travel expenditure by international visitors to Australia has increased by around 22% since 2013. And our labour market is more flexible than it was in the 1980s and 1990s. And that is supporting the movement of workers to industries and locations where there is greatest demand. For example, employment is shifting away from mining and manufacturing towards services, including health. Now, this transition is having different effects across different states. It's boosting economic outcomes in some parts of the country that felt the positive impacts of the mining boom less directly. On a number of measures, New South Wales and Victoria in particular appear to be benefiting with strong employment growth and strong services sectors buoyed by growing demand for health care from Australia's ageing population and demand for education from Asia's growing middle class. There's another less obvious transition that's underway in the Australian economy, and that's our relationship to the oil price. Just wanted to say a few words about that. The price of oil's fallen, I mean, leaving aside what happened overnight, the price of oil has fallen by around 70% since mid-2014, driven by increases in global oil supply. And Australia's a net importer of oil and petroleum products. So our economy benefits from lower oil prices, particularly through lower um, uh, fuel prices, which benefit Australian households and businesses. Traditional analysis is it's like a tax cut. But the oil story for Australia is a bit more complex when we look ahead. As our enormous LNG projects come online, production will ramp up and Australia will become a net exporter of oil and gas combined. And since the price of LNG broadly moves in line with the price of oil, in the future a low oil price will, price will not be so unambiguously positive for Australia. So what? Well, first, Australia continues to benefit from the investment phase of these LNG plants. The construction of the projects alone is estimated to exceed $200 billion, and our estimate is that about half of that was imported. Um, this does not include the substantial ongoing investment that will be needed to maintain the projects through their long production lifespans. As production at these plants ramp up, LNG exports will contribute significantly to GDP growth by 2017-18. Long-term contracts are in place for this increasing supply of LNG, but the price at which these contracted volumes will be sold is still expected to be broadly linked to movements in the price of oil. And so, as a net exporter of oil and gas, lower oil prices will damp our nominal GDP growth. Because LNG projects are very capital intensive, the sector will likely have deductions available to them that will reduce their tax liabilities in the short to medium term, even if prices were to recover. And the high level of foreign ownership in the sector, uh, it's over 90%, will reduce the impact that any profits would have on our national income. So that brings me back to the relationship between GDP and gross national income looking forward. There are at least some factors that suggest that we will continue to find ourselves facing a challenging income growth environment. That would have implications for growth in living standards and government revenue. Still, there are and will continue to be opportunities for Australia to grow and prosper. 
Understanding and responding to global trends and getting the macro and micro policy, policy settings right will be crucial. And in the long run, as each of the, uh, the intergenerational reports has shown, it's productivity growth that will be key in determining our living standards. So it's in our hands. This means that it will be an important time for economists. But as ever, it's also a difficult time to forecast the global and Australian economies. Against that background, uh, we recently conducted a review of our forecasting processes. And my colleague Warren Tees, who came in from the private sector, led this review. And I know that some of you would have heard him speak at, the, at, the, at, the, at this, this CEDAR event in February. As Warren foreshadowed, we will release the full review and our response to it later today. Warren agreed with previous reviews that our forecasts were unbiased in the long run and comparable in accuracy to other agencies and private forecasters. But he also noted that we tend to miss turning points. We have overestimated real GDP growth in the years since the global financial crisis, and there have been biases in our forecasts of prices that have persisted over horizons that are relevant for policymakers and their advisors. Now, neither Warren nor I think that we're alone among forecasters in that regard. That's an observation, not an excuse. But we do want, want to do what we can to attempt to improve our forecasting. So we're accepting each and every one of Warren's recommendations. Some of the actions that we are undertaking include that we're going to engage a panel of external experts to help us to consider a range of quantitative techniques that could be added to our toolkit. We're going to expand on our already extensive business and private sector economist liaison program to talk more with private sector commodity analysts. We're going to attempt to understand more deeply the impact of financial sector developments on our forecasts. And we're also going to experiment a bit more with the use of economy-wide modelling. Mm. Now, I don't know that adopting any one or all of these measures is going to improve the accuracy of our point estimate forecasts. But what they will do is that they will improve our understanding of the risks around those forecasts. And an understanding of those risks is important for policy making as the point estimates. And as, as we said before, we have um, over the past few years published a lot more about the risks around our forecasts, including in the budget papers. And in a world where there, there are significant global economic transformations underway, uh, understanding the risks is going to continue to be very important for us. Thank you.